Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to those out in virtual Zoom land. We appreciate you uh, joining us this morning. Uh, welcome to the second annual Team Research Symposium. My name is Jeff Rack. I am the faculty coordinator for the Interdisciplinary Science uh, Cooperative and professor of chemistry in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology. Uh, I wanna welcome you to the Physics and Astronomy and Interdisciplinary Science Building, or PIES as we more commonly refer to it. Um, and this much of this space was built with the sole intent to bring groups of people together um, in the spirit of advancing knowledge and, and creation. And I can't imagine a more perfect venue for this uh, symposium. We're excited to welcome you here to this facility. So thank you for coming. I will remind you of our um, uh, land acknowledgement here. I won't read it to you, but clearly you are familiar with it. Last year, the inaugural, team, uh, the inaugural team research symposium brought nearly 200 people together across campus and throughout the country uh, virtually to share the best practices in interdisciplinary uh, science and team research. I'm looking forward to building upon last year's event in person this year, well, hybrid, and uh, showing exactly why we are one at UNM. The Interdisciplinary Science Cooperative and UNM's grand challenges have partnered again together to bring our campus and community a broad range of sessions spanning multiple topics, such as industry partnerships, campus convergence, and creative ways that our researchers make positive impacts on the community. I encourage you to participate as many sessions as you can this week, whether in-person or virtual. Registration will remain open throughout the week, and many of the sessions will be recorded so they can uh, serve as a free research resource for you going forward, and that you can watch them at your convenience. I'd also like to thank uh, the people who helped execute this year's event. Over the past several months, these individuals have worked hard to create an experience that represents and supports our campus community. Thank you to the steering committee members, Vice President for Research, Ellen Fisher, Associate Vice President for Research, Mary Jo Daniel, Associate Provost for Faculty Success, Bill Stanley, Associate Provost for Student Success, Pamela Cheek, and Associate Dean for Research, the College of Arts and Sciences, Chris Lippin. I would also like to thank our planning committee, which includes Selena Connolly from New Mexico EPSCOR, Anita Grierson uh, from UNM's Grand Challenges, Larry Hancock, who is an alumnus of the College of Education and Human Sciences, Andrea Poli, professor of College of Fine Arts, Tim Schroeder from the Undergraduate Research Arts and Design Network, Stephanie, oh my goodness, I beg your pardon. How does one pronounce that? <laughs> Tofigi. Tofigi? Tofigi. I beg your pardon, uh, <laughs> Stephanie. Uh, uh, Stephanie Tofigi from the New Mexico Bioscience Authority and Hannah Torres from the Office of Vice President for Research. We would also like to thank the Office of Vice President for Research as well as the Expanding Course Based Undergraduate Research Experience or eCure for sponsoring the student team research competitions. We all look forward to seeing the projects of our student teams have developed and uh, we thank you for your supporting efforts. Lastly, not on the script, I would like to thank Irene Gray, who has worked tirelessly to put the nuts and bolts of this together. And so she deserves a, a, a commendation for that. Now, I would like to introduce our Vice President for Research, Dr. Ellen Fisher, a chemist and material science scientist with extensive academic leadership experience. Dr. Fisher has published over 160 peer reviewed papers that span diverse topics in plasma science, laser spectroscopy, material science, chemistry education, responsible conduct of research, and team science. She's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Chemical Society, and the American Vacuum Society. Ellen, thank you for being here. I need a mic. Oh, yes, you do. All right, we have no tape on the floor, so I don't know exactly where I'm supposed to be. And I'm holding a mic, so actually I could probably put this down here. There we go. All right, perfect. Um, so when people introduce me like that and they give all these things in different areas that I have done research in, have published in, um, I often think, does that mean I have a short attention span? Um, <laughs> or does it indicate that I get interested in a lot of different things? and I really like working on teams. So I prefer to think the latter. Um, 
So last year, uh, I will point out, I was very brand new to New Mexico and to the university. Um, and the Team Science Symposium served as an introduction to the community here at UNM. And I was really super excited. I gave one of the presentations on it because team science or team research is one of the things that is a passion of mine. And what I saw last year was an absolutely amazing testament to the work being done here and the connections that have been built in, you know, in spite of the pandemic or maybe because of the pandemic um, and even before the pandemic. Um, over the past year, I've taken that experience with me in establishing and executing more opportunities to build on our research efforts here at UNM. And I think those really need uh, collaborative efforts as well. Um, so this morning you'll get to the results, of, you'll get to see the results of this as we are kicking off our Reimagine Grand Challenges program. And I wanna say that it, I like to call it the Presidential Grand Challenges program because President Stokes started this in 2019-ish, uh, 2017-ish, somewhere, whenever she's first started here. That was one of her first things that she did. She launched the Grand Challenges to bring teams of researchers together to solve some of the greatest issues facing our state, our country, and the world. Um, and those included sustainable water resources, successful aging and substance use disorders. And I'll also point out, and you'll hear more about this this afternoon or later this morning, um, that there were a 10 additional great ideas that came out of that. And that's one of those things that I, that I really wanted to um, hone in on in reimagining it. Um, so since then, our Grand Challenges teams have generated more than $20 million in funding, and they continue to implement education outreach events and initiatives to improve lives around the state of New Mexico. Um, Diversity is the key to innovation, and I think the Grand Challenges program will provide UNM researchers with the tools and strategies needed to develop inclusive and diverse teams. That's one of the things we're aiming for with the reimagination of the program, and we look forward to building on the original program successes with this effort that will further emphasize how critical a team approach is to actually solving some of the greatest challenges, wicked problems that our world will ever face. Um, the collaborative research efforts of our faculty, staff, and external partners are paramount to driving innovation and discovery here in New Mexico. The pandemic has impacted the ability of many faculty to do this, which is why we have also established the We Are One Faculty Success Program. Over a two-year period, we've committed a $1 million, which it's still going on, so we're about a one year into that two-year period, to funding support of faculty's research efforts, and I'm already really incredibly proud of the outcomes that we've had through that initiative, which is a partnership between uh, the Office of the Vice President for Research, the Provost Office, and uh, UNM Advance. Um, from the Summer Research for Faculty Program, or SURF, to the Faculty Scholarship Time, or FAST Program, to the Program for Enhancing Research Capacity, or PERC. <laughs> we really like acronyms in my office. Um, nearly 150 faculty across eight different colleges and schools have already benefited from our Faculty Success Program. And perhaps more importantly, there have been numerous graduate and undergraduate students who have also benefited from those efforts. Um, this spring, we also launched one more acronym, the FRESH program, which stands for Fostering Research Expansion in, Expansion in the Social Sciences and Humanities. And that one is really cool. I think I, I'm starting to call it that we're teaching people how to fish. Um, and uh, really it's to support faculty in developing research proposals for uh, extra extramural funding like the National Research or National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, the inaugural cohort of that program consists of 22 faculty from 17 different departments, including one from a branch campus. So we're really trying to uh, live that we are one. Um, and we also have eight mentors for the program, which are bringing in, again, a, a, a huge range of expertise to that. So I'm really looking forward to seeing them succeed. And then lastly, um, I have, they, they had to put this in because it's become a mantra and I've actually heard other people saying the same thing. One of the things I say all the time is that research is education and that as the state's only Carnegie designated research one institution, this is truly at the heart of everything that we do. And the success of our faculty means that our students, both current and future, will truly benefit from all of these opportunities. I think that Pais is an excellent example of what happens when we invest in our interdisciplinary research efforts. And right now our students are being given the opportunity to learn through these highly collaborative research centers in a state of, art, state of the art facility and on cutting edge equipment. And this will literally put them ahead of their peers um, as they go out into the workforce. 
So with that, I'll just say, I hope that the Team Research Symposium also serves as a catalyst to further build on the amazing research that is already taking place at UNM. And that um, last year's event was an inspiration. And I have no doubt that this year's event will be likewise an, um, an inspiration and be further motivation to create new visions for the future. So thank you for being here and for exemplifying every day why uh, we are one at UNM. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you all. Uh, now I would like to welcome uh, President Garnett Stokes, President of the University of New Mexico. She helps coordinate UN, UNM's core missions of conducting top-tier research, ensuring compassionate and quality health care and health services, and promoting educational excellence at one of the, of the most diverse universities in the nation. She's made it a priority to foster collaborative efforts at UNM that benefit the entire state of New Mexico. Working closely with the Board of Regents, she continues to strengthen relationships with key stakeholders to advance UNM's unique mission. Thank you for being here, President Stokes. You have that. This, if you want, would probably make it a little easier. Am I in the right place? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Rack. And uh, it is a great good morning today. So welcome to this year's in-person symposium. I think we're all thrilled to be back in person. At my annual State of the University address this past February, I discussed how innovation serves as a powerful tool in improving our society. Advancements in our ways of thinking and in addressing challenges within our society are what bring meaning to our own stories, as well as to the stories of those around us. The challenges we have faced as a nation and throughout the world over the past two years have proven, have provided us all with opportunities for introspection. And as we know, it is those moments of introspection those times of self-reflection, consideration, and careful deliberation that drive true innovation. Look no further than your conference for a great example. Last year, when faced with COVID-related restrictions, you assessed your needs, crafted your solutions, balanced your options, then came up with the unique virtual setting that made it possible to bring hundreds of people across campus together to collaborate safely and successfully. That innovative approach to a problem really comes as no surprise. As Ellen mentioned, we are the only research one university in the state of New Mexico, and we have a long history in meeting the challenges that present themselves to us and to the communities we serve. It's what we've been doing since we were nothing more than a single building on a lonely mesa near a dusty train station. We intuitively understand that strength is to be found in our diversity. We have learned from experience how important it is to look to and lean on one another to meet these challenges. There is a simple word for it, teamwork. Our research mission is at the core of everything we do to improve our communities. And it all begins with a group of people, a team dedicated to making a difference. This is when true knowledge creation can take place. These interdisciplinary collaborations are the driving force behind developing innovative solutions to challenging issues. From our branch campuses to our industry partners and community connections, every voice is welcome. And I hope that we can bring more and more voices into the harmony over the next three days. Over that time, I look forward not only to watching you come together to share ideas and improve your research outcomes, but to also learn from one another. And over the next few days, you'll have a great opportunity to do so. The 17 presentations will feature an incredible total of 82 faculty and students representing 21 different departments across UNM's campus. These presenters also include universities like New Mexico State, Yale, UC Davis, and some of our community stakeholders, including Sandia National Labs, 
New Mexico X4, and six industry partners. Take a moment and think about all the potential collaborations that are waiting to emerge from these relationships this week. It's truly something to reflect upon. Speaking of opportunities, one of the key outcomes in the collaborative planning process for our long-term UNM plan, UNM 2040, Opportunity Defined, is to emphasize UNM's value to, the place, to be a place of research, diversity, discovery, healthcare, service, creation, innovation, and learning. This effort took a vast number of individuals, another big team to execute, and it will take even more to implement. I think you'll find over the next few days that we are already making significant strides in building our future at UNM. After all, we have you in our corner. The Team Research Symposium is more than an event. It is our celebration of our diversity and a genuine convergence of our most innovative minds. The Interdisciplinary Science Cooperative and Grand Challenges look forward to building on this campus-wide symposium over the coming years. And I look forward to supporting you in your continued accomplishments. Whether you're faculty, staff, an alumnus, or a community partner, I'm excited about hearing more about the connections you make during this symposium and joining with you in your desire to make a difference. Thank you for the work that you do to improve our local and global communities. And thank you for making me so proud to be president of this amazing institution. Have a great symposium and thank you so much. Great, thank you, President Stokes. Now I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for the symposium, Dr. Sanjeev Arora, as the founder and director of the Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, or Project ECHO. Dr. Arora has established a globally recognized telementoring model for scaling up health expertise in local communities quickly. Dr. Arora is also distinguished professor of medicine at the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center. With more than 15 years of experience managing viral hepatitis, Dr. Aurora developed and implemented the Hepatitis C Disease Management Program at UNM HSC. He is truly a leader in team research. We are honored to have him here today. Welcome, Dr. Aurora. Thank you. So the purpose of the talk today, I'm just going to give you an overview of what I'm going to do. I'd like to invite each one of you to join us in our quest to change the world. So the question then is, what change do we actually want to bring in the world? The change we want to bring is we want to reduce inequity. So one of the greatest challenges in the world is inequity, inequity across all different spheres, economic, health, education, water, climate, all kinds of problems. And this then becomes the root cause of wars and famines and instability and terrorism. In order for us to address these global problems, we need to reduce inequity. What am I going to try and do? Uh, I'd like this to be interactive in the end. So I will only speak for about 30 minutes and then would like to hear from you your thoughts of how you could collaborate with us in our quest to change the world. And I think, uh, thank you for your leadership, President Stokes. And um, thank you for your broad vision of grand challenges, but thank you also for 
bridging the Lomas divide and making us one university. Uh, we are really grateful for that. And, uh, so I'll start with a story of how ECHO was formed and then what we're trying to accomplish here. So I'm a gastroenterologist by profession. I'm a professor with a small p. <laughs> <laughs> And what happened was that in 2000, I've been, I've been here for many, many years. And um, in 2001, I, was, I walked into my clinic at the University of New Mexico. And there was a 43-year-old woman sitting there with two children. And there was a 14-year-old boy and a nine-year-old girl sitting with her. And I asked her, how can I help you? And she said, I have hepatitis C and I want treatment. So... I said, sure, we'll do that. How long have you had it? And she said, I've had it for eight years. So I said, why did you not come earlier for treatment? And she said, I had called your nurse and there was an eight month wait to see you. And uh, I lived 200 miles away and I would have to make 12 trips each way because there was no specialist in my rural area. And so I said, okay. Uh, she said, I'm a single mother. There's no way I could take 12 trips, take that much time off work. It would take me like two and a half days every time I wanted to come and see you. So I decided not to get treatment. I was feeling a little tired, but otherwise I could still work. So I said, why did you come today? And she said, I'm having pain here in the right upper side of my abdomen. Now, hepatitis C doesn't cause pain. I got quite worried and I did an ultrasound of her liver. She had a cancer of the liver about halfway between a golf ball and a tennis ball. This was too large for a liver transplant now. It was, she had cirrhosis, we could not remove it. And she passed away six months later, leaving these two children. And I asked myself, why did she have to die when I knew how to treat this disease? We had the medicines. I live not that far away from her. And the answer was, that she died because the right knowledge didn't exist at the right place at the right time. And it was impossible for her to get to the right knowledge. And without the right knowledge, it was impossible to get the right care at the right place at the right time. That was the challenge. ECHO was formed to address that challenge. And that's what creates the centrality of, the, of a university. Why am I confident that we as the University of New Mexico can change the world? Because we are the house of knowledge here. And if we democratize the ability to solve these problems, we can change the world. So what happened now, this woman passed away, but the challenge was much bigger. There were 28,000 patients with hepatitis C in New Mexico at that time. How did I know? Because it's a reportable disease. But the challenge was less than 1,500 of them had been treated. And they were coming to my clinic and I was seeing these people too late to treat. Many were dying. And I had only one good excuse that my wait was too long. I was working very hard. What else could I do, right? And I developed ECHO with the idea, I wanted to bring treatment I wanted to democratize the ability to solve this problem. And that's what I'm asking all of you to do and how you can partner with us. So I developed the model called ECHO, Extension for Community Health Outcomes, with the goal of essentially bringing hepatitis C treatment to anyone in New Mexico. Now, why were primary care doctors not treating it? because it was like a chemotherapy-like regimen. And they were saying, this is too toxic. We weren't trained to do this. There are too many lawyers in the state and on, so on and so forth. <laughs> and so people were not getting treatment, right? So that, that's the idea. Now the problem, of course, it was that this, why am I talking about, about changing the world? So of course, I talked about reducing inequity and our goal in ECHO is to democratize the access to best practice, not best practice in terms of knowledge alone, not having the knowledge, but the implementation of best practices 
in healthcare and education. That's a very different game because the best way to democratize knowledge is not Echo, it's Google. <laughs> but that doesn't, implementation of knowledge is a whole different game. And this problem, why do we need to actually change the world? Because this problem is so severe that 6 billion people in the world don't have the right knowledge at the right place at the right time. So you have to think in a slightly different way when 4,000 people are dying of TB every day. That doesn't happen in the US, but it happens because people in Africa, people in Bangladesh don't have access to the right knowledge to diagnose it, treat it. 1,800 children die every single day of diarrhea. We know that oral rehydration and some simple antibiotics, which in Ethiopia, where I'm going in two and a half weeks, basically cost less than a cent a day, but too bad nobody knows how to use it. So this is our mission, to democratize implementation of best practices. And our goal is to help 1 billion people by 2025. And that's where we need your help. And I have one of my colleagues from the, from the south of Lomas Peace Engineering. And I hope you'll uh, use, make a comment about what you're doing later on, but who uses ECHO for a very different reason. Um, so first we started the echo for hepatitis C, but then we knew that it could be used for any number of other diseases all over the world. So what is the echo model? There are four key principles, four pillars of the echo model. All four must be in place for it to work. First, we use technology like we're using today to share the expertise, leverage the expertise of people who reside at the university, one to many video conferencing. At that time, Zoom wasn't born. This was 2003. Then I went around the state of New Mexico that you know very well. And I went to the rural parts and we set up 21 new centers for treatment of hepatitis C in New Mexico. These were five were in the prisons because there were 2,500 prisoners with hepatitis C and not a single one had ever been treated. And 16 were in these rural clinics. And each was run by a primary care clinician, like a doctor and nurse practitioner. And I said, here is my protocol. This is how, I, how it's supposed to be done. And guess what they told me? They said, no, this is too dangerous. We can't do this. People can die from this treatment. And this is too risky. So I asked myself, how did you become an expert? You were not born a gastroenterologist. And so when I did my fellowship in gastroenterology in Boston in Massachusetts, I would see a patient present to my professor, see another one present to my professor. And after two years, they said, now you're a gastroenterologist. I said, aha, I'm going to use this model to create new hepatitis Cologists in New Mexico. Without them having to go for fellowship trainings or anything, we call this idea case-based learning. Why is case-based learning iterative guided practice we also call it all teach, all learn. Many, many things. Case-based learning, all teach, all learn, iterative guided practice. Why is that necessary? Because the problem is, has a characteristic called dynamic complexity. Whenever you're dealing with a challenge of dynamic complexity, you need guided practice. It's not enough for you to read a book and solve that problem. That's why we created residency programs and so on and so forth. And then we said we would evaluate outcomes. So in 2003, I started my first echo session. And the big box is the university, psychiatrist, pharmacist, and 21 of these clinics would join me once a week, Wednesday afternoon from 3 to 5 p.m. That was the only commitment that they made. And they would present patients to, to me and my psychiatrist, et cetera. And in two hours, we would discuss eight patients without their, you know, without anything about their names or anything, de-identified. And 15 minutes, I'd give them a lecture. And once, as we did this week after week, what happened was that in one year, they became complete experts, basically. Why did they become experts? They learned from us. They learned by doing. They were treating patients. 
They learned from each other. They were bringing one patient learning on eight every week. And they became specialists, basically. The weight in my clinic fell from eight months to two weeks. Over the subsequent five or six years, we treated 10,000 patients of hepatitis C, basically, across New Mexico. Even today, anybody in New Mexico, now there are 65,000 patients diagnosed because we have so much drug use. But anyone can get treatment if they want it within a couple of weeks here. So why was ECHO working? Because it was building a community of practice. It was creating a learning loop. And an interesting phenomenon was occurring. Force multiplication was occurring. That is the ability, we had democratized the ability to solve the problem in an exponential way. That is not doubling the capacity, not tripling the capacity, give it a 10x. That's what the world needs. We have described that concept in healthcare as force multiplication, exponential improvement. But the, another key concept merged, we call it all teach, all learn, that what experts had in their mind was insufficient to democratize the ability to solve because you needed one other component. That was the knowledge and expertise of the learners because they knew what the implementation challenges were, what the cultural constraints were, what were the economic constraints, what resources were available and what weren't. All of this, but when you melded it together in a community of practice, that's the key word, a community, these solutions emerged. Not only did you democratize the knowledge of a university, which is central, of course, to ECHO, you created new knowledge by this interaction. So this is an example of what happened. There was recently a paper out of India where we deployed ECHO in mental health. And what they found was they trained 22 doctors in the state of Chhattisgarh. And they found over 12 months, these 22 doctors in mental health treated 22,000 patients, basically. And that's an idea of force multiplication. So now, of course, this is a research symposium. I should talk a little bit about research. So the first type of research we did was self-efficacy, because remember, they said, we don't want to treat hepatitis C, it's too dangerous. What's your ability to identify suitable candidates for treatment? Went from 2.8 out of seven to 5.6 in 12 months. Scale is one, I have no skill, seven, I'm an expert who can teach others. What is your ability to treat hepatitis C? Of course, the problem was side effects of these treatments. Interferon was causing severe depression. It could kill you if your bone marrow counts went down. 2 to 5.2. But the force multiplication question was number five. Can you now become a local consultant or does everybody still have to come to the University of New Mexico to get treatment? Can you treat them there? 2.4 to 5.6, that is the force multiplier. When they become as good as us, the game changes. In that question resides the ability of the University of New Mexico and all of us working together in teams to change the world. Because if we could, democratize our expertise in the physics department, in the engine, and of course, in the peace engineering department, which, you know, in the engineering department where we have an echo for peace engineering, we can make a big difference through the principle of force multiplication. Overall competence 2.8 to 5.5. So we, there was then the, comes this question of motivation. Why would a primary care doctor be willing to spend time to learn about echo? Is it just for his patients? And here's the answer to that question. We published this. What people felt was enhanced knowledge, being well-informed and achieving competence was beneficial for them. It wasn't just about their patients. They wanted the ability, they, it increased their professional satisfaction. It reduced their professional isolation. It made them a part of a community. It gave them more self-efficacy. 
it helped them fulfill their mission in life, not the patient's goal, but their desire to serve was being fulfilled. That's why they were coming. But of course, all this was not good enough. It's not good enough that your doctor is having a good time. The question really is, can you do as good a job as a specialist can, right? So we did this head-to-head -head study uh, funded by the federal government. And we published this in the New England Journal of Medicine. Some of you are familiar with it. It's the leading medicine journal in the world. Where we showed that a rural clinician a prison clinician could get exactly the same outcomes and give chemotherapy as long as they were participating in this community of practice. This paper in 2011 was a game changer for ECHO. And there was an absolutely exponential improvement in adoption of ECHO since then. But now the challenge we had was there are only 2 million plus patients, uh, people in New Mexico. How do you help a billion people when there are only 2 million population. So we said, ECHO was about democratizing the ability to solve a problem. What if we democratized the ability to do ECHO? We have now got a platform. We had a technology platform. We had already got, I had I talked to Eric Vaughan, who's the founder of Zoom. And he had given me the Zoom license for the whole world. I had explained the vision like I explained to you. And we developed a software platform to track what, what Echo does, like a customer relationship management solution, et cetera. And we had developed a box of cloud-based repositories where all our intellectual property on hepatitis C and everything was residing. And we said, why don't we give this away to free to every university in the world? So that's what started happening. But first we launched a lot of echoes here for, for uh, basically diabetes and addictions and many, many things. And I'll tell you what we're doing in New Mexico in a moment, but we launched about 20 echoes in New Mexico, but we first taught University of Washington, then University of Chicago. And we gave them our, at that time, we get, uh, we, then we taught Harvard and then Johns Hopkins and Yale and MD Anderson and so on and so forth until we were able to, we basically saturated the system as I'll show you. But we also started doing an echo in a slightly different field in education, which I'll talk about, but we covered, so right now we have echo for 70 different disease areas. In the United States now, almost all the major universities, University of Missouri and Arizona and Oregon and Colorado and, and so on and so forth, we have three, it's a hub and spoke model. You've seen that. We have 350 hubs in the United States right now, 356 hubs. We were creating hubs at a fast pace, but we said we need more speed. So we, what we did is we democratized our ability to create hubs. And we created five super hubs. University of Missouri is one, University of Oklahoma is one, the University of Washington is one, and so on and so forth. And um, we have those super hubs in uh, 15 of them, MD Anderson is, a super hub for cancer and um, University of Chicago, American Academy of Pediatrics and so on. And globally right now we have 658 hubs and 28 super hubs all over the world basically. So talking, getting back to research, the key point I want to mention, which I'll mention in the end, but I want to introduce it now to you. The opportunities for research, we are only working right now in health education and a little bit in climate change. But our goal is to work on all UN Sustainable Development Goals, which I'll show you. If you're working on one of those, and if you're interested in democratizing your ability to solve it, reach out to Rachel, she's raising a hand, or me, and we want to help you do it. There's no necessity for any economic exchange between us. 
We are going to help you. We'll set you up. We'll train you. We'll give you our platform. So what are the types of research you can do? So we have 439 peer-reviewed publications showing that ECHO works. What does it show? That doctors and teachers like to participate 353. They are satisfied 247. Their declarative knowledge increases 206. They can practice it 126. But you can look at the electronic records and see that they are actually deploying that knowledge. Online training alone, what you call MOOCs, What's the problem with a MOOC? The MOOC is very good at disseminating knowledge, but when we study MOOCs, we find 90% of people don't even complete the course. And the 10 that complete the course, half of them don't apply it. It's not so easy. So we can show that it changes practice. 64 showing patient health outcomes improve and seven that community health outcomes. You can take your UN Sustainable Development Goal and apply the same framework and do research. And all ECHO research, of course, is team-based research, right? Because our teams are in the periphery, but we also have multidisciplinary teams. You need a multidisciplinary team, even at the university, to do ECHO. So you can basically use this. I, I don't need to go into this slide. But if any of you want to do research in your field, we have a large team. We have a team of 200 people full-time at the University of New Mexico. And we want to help you achieve your goal in life. If you have that interest, uh, reach out to us. So what are we doing in New Mexico? I think mean, that's, that's one of uh, President Stokes' goals. And so, I told you about the global shortages, but New Mexico has similar problems. This is just one example. We are short of every specialty. Any of you tried to get a specialty appointment recently? <laughs> no, if President Stokes is nodding, if she is nodding, I don't know what happens to the normal folks like us, right? It's a problem, isn't it? But this is, the, why is that a problem? Look at this. Blue means there is no dermatologist in that area, period. Green means, which is most of the state, we have less than a quarter of the dermatologists needed in that part of the state. Yellow means, which is everything else, we, have a, we do have a quarter. And I don't see much orange here. So how is a patient going to access care here, right? It's not going to be easy. And this is across our specialties. This is a huge challenge. So what we are doing in New Mexico is we are running echoes for all of these things from hepatitis C to neurology to opioids, which is a grand challenge, which I'll talk about. Cancer survivorship, skin, minors health, mental health and resiliency, perinatal health, improving quality of care for Medicaid patients, reproductive health, safe care, all kinds of echoes. So endocrinology for diabetes, infectious diseases, training first responders. India, we just recently launched an echo a week ago to reduce crime in New Mexico in partnership with the mayor's office and the state of New Mexico the idea is the same. We are basically saying, what if all the county sheriffs, if all the county police departments collaborated with each other to share information and help each other rather than duplicating and competing, can we do better? Getting back to the grand challenges, here is our echo for substance use disorder. This paper got the award for the best paper of the year where we were able to improve the the doctor capacity to actually treat an opioid addiction four times over the national average in low income zip codes in the United States. This is the US Department of Defense that is solving the same problem as the same grand challenge of substance use disorder, where we are trying to show that if 99 US Department of Defense clinics were compared with 
that participated in ECHO were compared with 1,283 clinics that did not. Opioid prescriptions went down 9.2% per year, uh, 23% per year versus 9.2% when they did not participate. So why do people die of opioid use? They die of two things, overdose of opioids, but the second is they die if you take benzodiazepine. This is a medicine like Valium along with it. You're not supposed to do that, but people do it. You do, and that also improved substantially. In diabetes in New Mexico, what were we able to show? 60% reported increases in self-efficacy, primary care, to manage diabetes. PCPs were twice as likely to adopt best practices. How did we know that? We looked at the electronic records. 67% reduction in referrals required. And there was huge cost benefits shown by many other people because you didn't have, so and this is, this is a study out of uh, Rutgers. What they did is they trained 25 doctors to manage diabetes and showed inpatient hospitalizations went down 43% and 61% reduction in inpatient spending. I'm going to move to a different area. Public education is the engine for justice, right? We all know that. The reason we are all sitting in the room is we got a good education at some point in our life. And it, I, talk, I started this talk by reducing the inequities, right? This is the best, not healthcare, but this is the best way to reduce inequities. So what's the challenge? And this is where some of you may decide to also focus. Only 24% of children are proficient readers by the end of third grade here in New Mexico. This is catastrophic. Why is it catastrophic? Because in most schools, after fourth grade, what do we do? We give them material to read. We're not trying to teach them to read. And so what we're doing in New Mexico is we fall behind there and that creates a lot of downstream challenges for us. Because this is federal data saying 57% will not catch up unless we do something different. So we started ECHO for school teachers instead of ECHO for doctors and nurses in 2017. And now, then we did in 2018 for graduates, for teacher pipeline, technical education, in 2021, look at all the echoes we did. Social and emotional learning, supporting and inspiring teachers, webinars for parents, echo for community schools, American Indian uh, schools, superintendent support and leadership training for principals and superintendents and in American Indian early childhood language project. And 21, 22, we have many ambitious plans in the area. So I, I'll skip this because I want to leave time. I've got about two minutes left. We have now so far, uh, anticipate, we have helped, we believe, uh, train 2,388 educators and 162,000 students in New Mexico. Um, when the COVID came along, ECHO dramatically started escalating. Why? Because people didn't have any other way to get best practices. And you can see overall, <laughs> too much electricity. <laughs> overall, 3.27 million times healthcare providers around the world have attended ECHO sessions and been mentored. And this means more than 1 million unique healthcare providers. So what do we do for COVID infectious disease office hours, critical care for COVID-19 patients, um, com training community health workers, many, many ECHO projects. And we also were approached by the US government and launched ECHOs nationally, trained 41,000 healthcare providers in New Mexico in partnership with Health and Human Services Federal government on all different aspects of the COVID response. And 
most in about September of 2020, the U.S. government came to us and said, you know, only 1% of our people live in U.S. nursing homes, 40% of deaths are there. This was a catastrophic problem. They said, can you help us improve this situation? So we launched an ECHO nationally, partnered with 99 universities in this country, all the leading universities set up. 330 weekly echo networks. In each echo network, 30 nursing homes participated, 9,000 nursing homes participated, more than a million patients were benefited, and mortality came down. And it's really uh, something we did rapidly uh, for a national emergency. So what makes echo work is team-based care. Technology is of course necessary, but not sufficient. Task shifting is the idea of every human being working at the highest level of his human potential. Now you'll see this has nothing to do with healthcare anymore. Interprofessional consultation is you need many experts, guided practice, mentor mentee relationships. If you do all three of these things, guided practice, mentor mentee, and many experts, human performance will improve. But what really makes ECHO work is communities of practice, love and respect and kindness and empathy and community building and joy of work. All teach, all learn, I've already talked about key. So how can you get involved, okay? These are our goals, right? We currently work only in good health and well-being, right there, quality education, gender equality, our recent data is showing in India that 72% of all learners in ECHO are women because they have a much harder time in low-income countries accessing good knowledge, good care, et cetera. And we work, we started some work on climate change, uh, but partnership for the goals is what ECHO works on. But you get reducing inequalities, but you can work on so many of these. Life below water, life on land, peace, justice. We are about to launch an echo for attorneys for good legal care in rural areas. And uh, I'm going to stop here by saying that democratizing your ability to solve problems can great, bring great joy of work for you. And I encourage you to join us in this quest to change the world. Thank you. If somebody wants to make a comment or a question, I'd love to hear from you and hear your concerns or, or comments. Yes. Uh, in the area of healthcare, I can understand the return on investment very clearly. When we look at some of the other research areas, how how do the ECHO projects get funded? All ECHO projects uh, around the world are either funded by philanthropy or by federal or uh, grants. We typically don't charge for our services. And so whether you do it in water or whether you do it in, in climate change or peace engineering, you have to find grants. But what we have found is since I started ECHO, more than $2 billion of grant support have been released by different types of funders. So there's all this network global is being funded. We have 60,000 organizations being on the learning network. As I said, 658 hubs. You need to find your passion. You need to get your idea. What is the, what is the problem you want to solve? that you know how to solve. And then how will you democratize it? We can help you with that. And then seek who are either government or philanthropic funders that are aligned with the goal. What, what is the value proposition you can take to a funder, whatever that funder is? You can tell them, I will help you solve your problem with speed, with scale, with higher quality, and at much lower cost. That's the value proposition. You need to go to them and help them solve their problem, not your problem. And then you have alignment. That's how we get funding from the state. 
You go tell them it's not like this is Echo's priority. This is what you want to do. This is what your help, your strategic plan says do the A, B, C. We can help you do it faster, cheaper, better, much lower cost. That's the idea. Anybody else? Yes, please. I'm curious to hear how uh, it is working or has been used um, overseas in, in kind of like global public health models. Is it is it similar? I know that we, I mean, as is this kind of hub and spoke. Have you had success in doing that in a place like Ethiopia, for example? Or how is it, I guess, how is it the same and how is it different compared to working within the United States? What's different is, of course, our partners. So World Health Organization is an echo hub and a partner. The U.S. Center of CDC. US aid, they're all echo hubs and partners. And so what we do is we partner with them because often these countries don't have enough resources. But then it's a two-step process. We typically go in with grant funding or philanthropic funding. And we have many, many echo projects there in all those countries. As I said, um, uh, in, we work in all 50 countries, hubs in 40 countries already. So I think what we do essentially is that we go in with philanthropic funding, demonstrate proof of concept, and then the government takes it over. But yes, the biggest uses of ECHO are public health uh, issues. Uh, because in public health, teamwork and collaboration is required even greater than in clinical care of an individual person, right? Because public health involves the intersection of economics, it involves the intersection of community, academics, government, and all those things. And building community is important. Anybody else? Well, I guess I must have made myself clear. <laughs> at, least, at least that's a, it's always a dangerous assumption if you don't have questions. <laughs> Let's uh, thank Dr. Aurora one last time. Thank you very much.